this weekend, me and my three friends took a car drive to Bydgoszcz to play in one of the biggest tournaments in Poland. A 79 people showdown tournament there for Star Wars Unlimited uh, was something that made me really excited to go. And so I think that to my friends, because we all were very happy to drive there and play in the Museum of Waterworks. Yeah, I know it sounds weird, but it's a cool place with a lot of greenery around, um, fresh air and two toilets. And, you know, in general, it just looks nice and, and you have a lot of space in it, although the rooms are pretty small, but you have like several rooms when you have the, the tables in it. Uh, so I already played here in some Flesh and Blood tournaments, so very happy to attend it again. Um, and my very unique version of Sabine Yellow with Jetta City and droids in it um, had almost finished top 8. I finished 10th or 11th place and, and with a 5-2 score in Swiss because we had 7 rounds. So I thought to myself, well, even though I didn't get to top 8 uh, and I was just one win away from getting into it or just better tie breaks, I thought to myself, it's it's um, maybe it would be good to talk about deck because I feel like no one else plays uh, a Sabine version like I do, uh, or even play in a similar fashion that I do, so maybe it would be cool to um, explain it and talk about the matchups and 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 some peculiar situations that I had uh, been in with the matches. So yeah, let's do that. This video is sponsored by Elgato, who's producing a plethora of hardware for the streamers. And if you want to use the same microphone as I do, or maybe a stream deck from the new Neo line, you can use my code for 5% off. And also the video is sponsored by Rebel.pl, the Polish distributor of Star Wars Unlimited. But not only that, you can also buy board games and card games in both Polish and English on the website. But yeah, well, mostly just Star Wars Unlimited, right? So this is the metagame breakdown. Um, we had 18 Boba Fetts, 15 Sabines, and then a very... Uh, I'm just going to put like Krennic, Eden, Eden, and Darth Vader into one pool because they all play in a similar fashion, typically, right? So that's uh, 21 control decks that are like typical blue control decks. And there are six Tarkins, which I don't really want to put in the same basket because they play differently. So... We have like a pretty healthy representation of all the ears apart from Jin Erso. So some sad noises for the Jin Erso fans. Uh, she's not represented in, that, in this tournament, but every other a uh, agent, uh, every other leader is. But when I was trying to like pick a deck for myself for, for this tournament, I thought to myself that control should be overrepresented because in general, in Poland, in every card game, it just feels like players gravitate towards more controlish type decks because of a perception that playing aggro decks is pathetic and I'm too smart to play an aggro deck, so I'm going to play a control deck because that's the big brain deck. You know, that, that's that's my consensus for that I reached for overplaying, you know, 25 years of card games or even more. So it's like, and so it's something that, just happens in the Polish community. Uh, and I thought it's going to be even more control than what we had right here. I'm actually very uh, surprised that we had still so many Sabines and still so many Boba, um, you know? So, so I was anticipating there was going to be more than six Star Faders. So I kind of overthought this, but it's still a healthy re representation of the three pillars. Han Solo and Luke Skywalker would put more in the mid-range like point uh, of the um, of the meta game, although they are not the same kind of mid range like Boba Fett because they don't typically cheat out the tempo in a similar fashion, right? So Boba Fett is in its own league uh, in that case, um, and uh, there's a very healthy representation of Boba Fett's like 18 out of 70. Eight in this case here, not 29, so for some reason, uh, it's 78 here listed. Uh, 18 of them being Boba Fett is uh, is pretty, yeah, pretty heavy. Uh, I'm surprised that there were even five of the yellow uh, Boba Fetts. Uh, it's kind of like my, my friend from my car played the exact same version of KDOD's Bobbies, um, the deck that he took the first place in the US lately. Um, and I thought that there's going to be still less of them because they're not your typical that and they require so much practice to just because they play so much differently than the green version so five of them being represented here was actually a surprise to me um then we have sabine Renz with, with 15 i'm very surprised that there were any double red sabines because i don't think they're positioned well in the metagame uh at all 
and um uh, there's actually a pretty healthy split between the um yellow and green right and a part of that we have the typical control decks so i played seven rounds um and essentially i played a different character almost every round so when it comes to that so to, so essentially the split was like this so my round breakdown was like this i played first round green sabine then a blue vader then an item blue then a chronic green then a double green talking then an item green and then boba green so as you can see it was a healthy split between like the opponents i essentially never played the same character twice because even if i played Aiden, one was green and one was blue and they played very differently so i thought it was very interesting that you come into it's just one expansion right it's one expansion of thousand unlimited and the meta game is so open people can play so many different decks and they even though they might have been some similarities. They play so much differently uh, from each other. So it was very exciting. But let's talk about my deck and why I choose um, to play Sabine even in the first place. So this is my deck. I'm going to put a uh, link, of course, in the description uh, to the deck itself. And uh, we're going to talk about what was my experience. Why, how did I build it? Why did I build it this way? And what would be the changes after the tournament? Because I definitely would do some changes to the deck itself. So, uh, you know what? I'm actually going to swap to a normal camera like this. So I can show you the cards because I just prefer it this way. Uh, you know, and also, random note, I am using a Game Genic, uh like matte double sleeves. And they look awful on camera and in real life because they literally just make the cards look worse, as you can see. Right? On the right, you have just one normal dragon shield. Uh, and that's it. And on the left, you have the dragon shield and inside of a matte, like, double sleeve from Game Genic, And it looks awful. But... When you shuffle the deck, it's, I have never experienced one like this. It's just so nice to shuffle the cards because it, it just feels so nice to hold it. And it makes shuffling so much easier uh, with those double sleeves. I actually use them when I play in tournaments because they just make it so easy. Uh, but for the camera, I just took off one of, of each card so it looks nicer. So um, we're going to go through what we have. First and foremost, Sabine, I think because I fought that there will be so many control decks in the meta game that choosing sabine is gonna be a good choice right and that's why i took sabine uh and i um, was still torn on which color to go with so my last i played red with aggression and i liked it but i don't think the card pool is good enough because you still have to like just play cards that are just bad like you know saw guerrera because you have no other options you know or you have to play Wolfie in, in the main deck because there are no other options. Like, it's just the deck is just not good because of that. It has very limited options, you know? Uh, the green, of course, was on my mind as well. It's just standard good. It's it's uh, it's a good choice. It's a safe choice. Uh, but I wanted to play yellow because uh, of two things. Jedi City and, of course, the Millennium Falcon, right? And many people played with the 30 HP base, but I played with Jedi City, and I will stand by it. It's my own personal like playstyle of, of playing Yellow Sabine warrants using Jeddah City because I try to fight for board control in majority of the matchups for a certain amount of time and then swip the flitch, uh, uh, swip the flitch, flip the switch and go aggro. And for that, Jeddah City helps me immensely. And uh, I had many, many matches where I lost the dice roll because I only won one. I actually literally from seven rounds of Swiss, I won one dice roll. And uh, in other matches, when I was playing always from a back foot, right? Because you always go like, this, when you go second, you always like uh, expose to your opponent's trades and so on. And Jedi City allowed me to go back into the match save some of my creatures destroy one of my opponent's creature and fight for the board and without jedi city i would have not be able to do that so for me jedi city is an mvp but this is also because i play with creatures that stick to the board that's why i played c3po and that's why i call this deck a droid sabine so first and foremost i play from the ground units right we're gonna we're gonna go make a breakdown the ground units are, are like this two free cpos three auto d2s and this is the core of the deck. This is something that I actually loved. And I think 
majority of the games that i won were won because of one of those units um mostly c3po that's so playing two of them was actually one of the mistakes i should have played three of them i thought that maybe two will be enough but when i played it more and more and more and more i always was like dude I, I just want this guy to be always in my opening hand you know he's so good but why more on that in a second two specs for soldiers because i mean that tech tech cards right and typically they go into the mana and i don't want to play three of those because of that so i play only two and i want them to be clogging my uh deck choices now three sabine wrens i don't really like her but there's nothing better to play so we we play with her two lawful insurgents so those those two cards were actually a, a medal of ceremony sorry so, um metal ceremony in the first iteration of my deck uh but i anticipated to maybe play more mirror matches against other sabines and because of that i wanted to play with more creatures that have free attack in the front uh so i swapped them to a lot of insurgents and in general probably should have not done that but um i would probably still probably play two little insurgents or just swap it or swap just one to a third superior third sif repeal but we're gonna talk about that in a moment so two little insurgents three ezras um because i anticipated as i said more aggro decks so i wanted to play with three of those instead of just three rogue operatives because of the attack in the front but uh, and also when i was playing metal ceremonies ezra is slightly better because you can attack with ezra complete the attack and then from the top of the deck you can play a metal ceremony it, it does happen it doesn't happen often but it, it is a possibility and that's why i also was playing ezra in the beginning but i didn't want to swap to more versions uh, sorry more copies of rogue operative because i anticipated there's gonna be more aggro and the one attack on the front actually makes a huge difference against units like battlefield marine or like opposing um uh, like any any opposing unit that essentially have free health right so i thought to myself that ezra is gonna be more important because of that um in retrospect i should have probably played more rogue operatives but that also assumes that you win a dice roll more often right because this creature is just so much better when you win the dice roll and you go first so those are the three drops three fleet lieutenants are absolutely amazing card because they work so well with the droids so um and then we have three k2so because why not uh and we have two chewbaccas now chewbaccas i thought they, i thought they're gonna be better um they had some impactful rounds like in one match against aiden uh there was a moment when my opponents just had to skip a turn because attacking into the Chewbacca just made no sense it would just deal more damage but at the same time Chewbacca is so exposed to vigilance that I don't think I would have played two copies of Chewbacca anymore because vigilance just wrecks it right it doesn't get taken down by takedown but the problem is you are risking a lot if you drop him on the board and your opponent has vigilance for example right so uh, I know on five mana it doesn't matter, but if your opponents are playing like a green Sabine, maybe they ramped and they actually have six. And if you play against a blue uh, Iden, maybe they just have vigilance for four, and then you're absolutely dumps it. So those Chewbaccas are probably would become something else. Most likely, uh, the two Chewbaccas would become uh, actually the third copy of Sifri PO um and uh one more rogue operative instead so i also keep my curve lower to make c3po better and i'll explain that really in a second so uh the main reason why i even play like this kind of like force of, on the ground is because i typically try to stay on the board active with a unit always on it right so the four health on r2d2 and c3po is amazing because it enables your fleet lieutenants every single time because no one is going to destroy them with any unit um on the board in 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 turn one and also enables your wing leaders so your wing leaders actually have way more value over the course of the game because your units are sticking more to the ground even though your opponent might attack into one of those it's still fine because if someone plays for example a 3-2 unit attacks once into a r2d2 or a c3po then it already soaked three damage right 
it had an effect while entering the game and then it will have an effect when attacking so essentially uh a c3 po in most of my games when i played it on round one sorry on turn one i look at the top of the deck i get some informations maybe i draw it and because i played 20 cards for two mana and 18 cards for three mana there's like around 40 percent chance that I'm going to hit the draw because I count how many cards on my hand are two and three mana and how many cards are for two and three mana in my mana, uh, in my resource draw. So I know what are the odds of me drawing a card or a specific card that I want for next turn, right? So in general, I was drawing very often cards with the C3PO when I just slammed it on the board. And then when someone attacked into it, right, I can attack back, kill the three, two, uh, and had another chance at drawing a card. So not only it soaked the three damage, it drew me one or two cards, or zero, but let's assume it, one, it drew me one card, because that would be like almost the average. Um, and if that was not even like the, the option to do, I buffed it with a wing leader, or I buffed it with a fleet lieutenant, and killed a two three drop, because that also happens. Like when someone drops a two three and you drop a C3PO, they will not attack into the C3PO most of the time, but they will expose themselves to a fleet lieutenant, so the C3PO kills the 2-3 and stays alive, and then you have two units, and you still have the effect of the C3PO for the next round. So, um, for the next phase. So this is, like, in incredibly powerful, but e it's even better against blue control decks, and you you're going to ask why. Well, the thing is, they never want to use a power to the dark side on a C3PO or an R2D2, even worse, right? But they have to. And if they do that, then you most they had you have like a 40% chance that it will just net them plus zero because you didn't lose a card because you drew a card with C3PO. And I had many uh games against Irons, uh not only at the tournament, but in like in testing, when I drop a two drop like a Cypher PO or R2-D2 on turn one. Then they respond with a power to the dark side. And then I just drop a Sabine and R2-D2 on the, on the follow-up. And they, even if they have another copy of the power of the dark side, it essentially just le legit, it's just useless at that point. And they have to resource it because they typically will uh, hold the power to the dark side to destroy your Sabine on the four resource turn, right? And that's something that you want to avoid. So you're going to be able to um, make your board more sticky because of that and make your opponent's power to the dark side uh, essentially kind of useless. And I had one game when my opponent had three power of the dark side. I sparked a rebellion one and then played multiple C3POs and R2D2s and essentially that rescued my Sabine and that Sabine ran away with the game because of a wing leader on top of that. Like none of that would have been possible if I would have not been drawing additional cards with the droids and just motivating my opponent to just either resource it or use it on these small value creatures. Now you can also see that in this in those cards in this card selection that I have, I don't actually play Leia at all. And Leia's was like whenever I see someone play Yellow Sabine, they always play Leia. I don't play Leia because the two two stats are just awful in my eyes. They don't really give you any kind of advantage, and I don't want to play her instead of something that I can just drop on the board. Majority of the units that I have here, you just drop them on the board and you forget. The only thing that I don't drop on the board is the spec for soldiers that I either keep on my in my hand as a as a answer, right? Or I just straight up resource them. Everything else I'm dropping on the board because I want to take board control. And Leia doesn't really help me with getting board good control because she doesn't trade well or is straight up just killed with no no, uh, no value. Um and uh, the only useful thing would be to like drop an R2D2 on top of her, but at the same time, like, what would I? And it, it does doesn't it doesn't really does that doesn't really achieve what I want to achieve uh, with the deck. I want sticky creatures on the board, uh, and the only non-sticky creatures here are a lot of insurgents that were put into the deck because of the trade possibility uh, with the free attack, right? So you're able to kill like a battlefield marine, for example. Um, so yeah, those are the ground units. Let's go now towards the space. There's nothing really surprising in space. 
uh but there's some experience gained from those games that i played uh that can actually be useful for you guys as well so in this meta game i actually prefer to play alliance x-wing in most 10 ones than uh, green squadron a-wings the, the a-wings are just i don't know man you play against another uh, like green sabine you never want to play this right because uh, they would just kill it with their own a-wing with ecl and you can't really do that back um so that's a problem uh alliance x-wing at least doesn't get traded by seventh fleet defender when you play against boba green uh while if you play a-wing they just ecl seventh fleet defender first ambush then shielded and you just essentially never get your space back so you have to go on the ground so the alliance has x-wing like is not my favorite opener anymore in this meta game um obviously wing leaders are fantastic in this deck because of the how how sticky the creatures are um and uh then we have two red freeze now i only played two copies of red freeze because my experience with them is that they don't really give me much like i almost never wanted to slam this on the board because there are so many better options in my deck than just a red three uh and even if i play a red three it, i open myself up to uh, just straight up very easy removal or ecl and because of that the red three i just cut it down to to two um and i never looked back i'll be honest with you i even cited them out in some matchups um millennium falcons absolutely the best card in the deck um they are amazing and if you don't draw them you always feel at a huge disadvantage and unfortunately in my first match against green sabine mirror i didn't see a single falcon in all three games and i won actually against the green sabine when i lost the dice roll and my first first match against that sabine was won because of this guy this is like the the ghetto uh falcon right it's like the bad falcon it costs you four has the same stats it has an ambush which is like a kind of better but not exactly it's a, just a little bit different version of falcon right because falcon costs you two actions to attack for free but it allows you to hit the base while the 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 gunship gunship allows you to just kill instantly a creature but never attack the face so in that particular green sabine matchup he actually won the match because I was able to retain control or like reclaim control and then retain the control um, of space. And that was one of the key pieces to gain the space con space control so he could never go back there. While Jeddah City allowed me to get the control of, um, of the ground and never let go of the control on the ground. So even though he was aggressive towards my base, I could have established board control and then just strike back and finish him up real quick now i think if i would have to change something aussie tux would have been a free of in my deck and i would have you know what i probably would just cut chewbacca's add one aussie tuck and one sifu po that would be probably the, the easiest thing to do uh all right so space is pretty easy like there's not many things to even choose from so that's what you play and yeah i would just add a third aussie tuck instead of a chewbacca and the other Chewbacca would become a C-3PO, and that's essentially it. Now, when it comes to events, um, we have three for a cause of believing because, <laughs> yeah, this, this card is ridiculous. Like, uh, I, I think I have, I, I think I put for a cause I believe in into a resource row once, and that was in my first ever game of Star Wars Unlimited, and I realized that was the biggest mistake that I ever made so far <laughs> and i never repeated that the card is nuts like but you guys know it's like it's absolutely ridiculous and also think about this when you have c3 po's this card becomes even better because now you can play a c3 po and uh, like choose what you put uh, what you have on sorry not choose but you see what you have on top or you can first for a cause i believe in actually what i'm talking about I want to say R2-D2. What I wanted to say is R2-D2. So R2-D2 allows you to choose if you have a heroism card on top or not, right? So your force for a cause becomes more effective. So you just can skip a, a, a card that doesn't deal damage. But with C3PO, we can actually go the other way around. So you play for a cause I believe in first, you deal the damage, and then you put a card on the top that you draw with a C3PO, right? 
uh, or you attack with the CFPO and then you draw it as well. So there's another synergy with four cards, I believe, in that you typically don't have if you don't play the droids. Now, other than that, three surprise strikes because they are absolutely bonkers and they even have more value when you play cards that are sticky to the ground. So you have the CFPOs, you have the R2 D2s, and you're able to have consistently more targets for the surprise strike and trade up as well because of the huge amount of health that your units have so absolutely bonkers um then we have two sneak attacks in main and i play them um it was more of an experiment because i don't like heroic sacrifice i don't have a singular heroic sacrifice in my deck because i just couldn't make it work with the way that I played the game. I just never felt like I have a moment to actually use the heroic sacrifice. Uh, and sneak attack actually made more sense. Um, sneak attack is fantastic with um, with Rebel Lieutenant. Actually won me one game because I played a Rebel Lieutenant. I had zero board control. My opponent was at six health. I pinged him with Sabine. And then I from my from from my empty board, I played sneak attack. Fleet Lieutenant, Fleet Lieutenant goes into the board, he's ready, right? He targets himself with this ability when played, so he gets plus two and instantly attacked, right? So, and you just go five to the dome, and that's it. So you essentially, I don't think there's another card combo in the game that allows you to deal five damage to the base from an empty board. So those two sometimes are just insane value when you play against a 25 base like this is those two cards are essentially killing 20 percent of your opponent it, from your hand right you don't have to get anything on the board you just play this and that and you deal boop, five damage to the face of course if they don't have a sentinel so that's a that's a big swing that you can do and actually won me one game uh other than that sneak attack has good uh synergy with ezra because if you start to turn with attack with Ezra and you have a sneak attack on top of um on top of the deck, then you're able to like make some sick combos that you typically would not be able to, right? Because you don't have to lose a card from your hand to actually get the value out of the sneak attack, which is typically the downside of playing sneak attack. You have to lose a card from your hand because you play that from your hand and another creature, and that creature dies anyway, right? So by playing a sneak attack from top of the deck, uh, you gain a lot more value and you squeeze out mana you cheat out mana because of that now i also played two bamboozles in my uh main deck because i anticipated that i'm uh, this this card is gonna be good against both other sabines because of wing leaders and so on um or just cheesing out tempo for free with yellow cards that's also why i played um uh, lawful insurgents because that they are yellow they are cunning and that you can discard them um, in case you want to play the bamboozle for free, and you couldn't do that with the metal ceremonies that I had in the first uh, deck version. So I put in more yellow cards to have the possibility of bamboozling for free. Uh, and it's also like fantastic against um, Vader control. But at the same time, I don't think it's necessary because if, even if they play Charleston, you just use Jeddah City, and the first Charleston just dies. It doesn't really kill anything. So. Um, this is like the best option against Childson because you don't have to get anything in your hand to deal with it. You just have the answer on your board the entire time. So whenever they play Childson, you're actually pretty happy because now this gets value. Uh, but Bamboozle, I would probably still play in the main deck even if I didn't get like any positive, like maybe not any, but I didn't get a lot of positive results with it in this sample size that I had in the tournament. Uh, I still think it's enough of like possibilities happening in the game that this would warrant uh, the deck choice. Now, um, sideboard. Sideboard is very, I would say easy actually to understand why those options are here. So third sneak attack um, in case you are playing um, against other Sabines because you want to retain the board control and just like when you're playing from back, fo back foot, you can cheese out uh, cards from your hand which you know typically doesn't matter what what you have in your hand you just want to not lose your board or you want to race for damage and sneak attack allows you to do that um instantly so that's why i would put a third one um when i play against other ones bamboozle similar 
similar mindset, right? You want to cheese out um, the the actions. So that's also like here for either control, um, either control or, or mirror matches. And the same goes for sneak attack. So just get third copies in when you play against typical heavy control decks or not. Uh, in case of Argo, right? Then you have Spark of Rebellion that I was playing in in the main deck instead of Bamboozles. And I'll be honest with you, you can actually just choose. If you play, if you would want to play with my deck, you can play Spark of Rebellion in the main deck if your metagame has more control. So if your metagame has more control, you put Spark of Rebellion in the main deck. If it's more like aggro, you probably just put Bamboozles in um or like more mid-range as well then bamboozle this might be a, an option but i i actually love spark of rebellion and i'm a little bit regretful that i didn't play it in main deck because maybe you would actually squeeze out the one more win to be in top eight but who who knows so um t not right now here i had them in the sideboard but they could be easily in the main board and that would be just be personal choice uh, or meta game choice in in a lot of the cases. Now I also have three Wolfies, and those are going in against aggro matchups uh, because of the three attack, very similar thought process like the Lotal Insurgents, right? And also go in into any decks that heal. So any blue deck that you play, Wolfies are going in. Very funnily enough, whenever I play against blue control players, every time I play Wolfie someone forgets that Wolfie triggers also on attack. They only think that it's when it's played and they never check that it's on attack. They always do that mistake once and they will never forget about that. But it can actually happen. And it did happen again on this tournament when a double blue Aiden player just literally forgot that it's also an attack and was like, wait, what do you mean I can't heal with my hero? And I was like, well, my attack with Wolfie. And he was like, he had to read the card. And he was a good player, so he just literally just never read the card before. Um, so three of those. Uh, my first iteration of the sideboard had two of Wolfies and one Heroic Sacrifice, but as I said, I don't like Heroic Sacrifice. So I just put third Wolfie because I knew that it's going to help against the more aggro matchups and the control matchups anyway. And then we have uh, two Disabling Fang Fighters that I do think are great answers against Entrenched, and that's about it. And maybe traitors, but even Bamboozle helps against traitors because what's funny about Bamboozle is that Bamboozle, if you play it for free, you essentially time walk your opponent. If your opponent is doing a um, a, a traitorous, I had a situation like this against um, Tarkin. So Tarkin played a traitorous uh, on my red free. I used the Bamboozle for two mana because I didn't have even uh, um, any other options to use the mana otherwise. So I just used Bamboozle for two mana and then uh, then tapped his red free. The traitorous bounced to his hand. Tra uh, red free went back to my side of the board. It was tapped, of course, but it buffed the other units that I already had on the board. And essentially he skipped his turn while I attacked his face and played another free drop. It could have been even more like abysmal for him if i just played it for free and had anything else to play for two mana uh and disabling fang fighters are kind of similar have the kind of similar role because you know there's no other targets essentially like what what you're gonna do you're gonna destroy the shield you're gonna destroy one experience token like that doesn't really give you a lot of value it's not terrible it also lowers your value of of for because i believe in because it's only red but it's like not the best. My experience with disabling Fang Fighters is that they are rarely useful because when you side them in matchups that they are needed, like against Entrench, you're winning that matchup anyway. Like my deck was built in a way to punish control players, and that's what happened. So um, I don't know. Uh, it, it would require me to test more, but for now, I feel like disabling Fang Fighters could be actually thrown out for this first set you know maybe for set two when there's going to be more upgrades and bounties this will come back but right now i don't really feel like those are needed when you also play bamboozles and your game plan is just to punish the control decks anyway so what would i change after the tournament now that i know the what i know and i think it will be pretty easy so first and foremost c3po needs to have three copies so uh, what I would do right now, I would just cut Chewbacca's completely. 
add one C3PO. So Chewbacca's out, plus one C3PO, and plus one Ausitak. Essentially, those cards always were good, and Chewbacca was like, meh. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes maybe even shit. So I would have cut that out. And then, depending on your meta, local metagame, I would choose um, either more Ezra Bridges or more Rogue Operatives. And if your aggro, if, if your me local metagame is more aggro, I would actually choose only to play Ezra Bridges. And then the Rogue Operative becomes one Chewbacca. Essentially, if your lo local meta game is more diverse or just less aggro in general, then I would go only for rogue operatives and no Ezra Bridges or just one Ezra Bridger and one Chewbacca. But in most cases, you can just scrap him, I would say, in this case. And then, depending again on your meta choice, on your meta game, is bamboozles are going to be in the side or are going to be in the main and instead, you're going to bring in Spark of Rebellion. So essentially, you either play Bamboozle's Bane if your local meta game is heavy on uh, tempo or aggro, and you play Spark of Rebellion if it's more control and mid-range. And I feel like in most cases, I would probably start with Spark of Rebellion in the main because of that. Remember, also, I play only two copies of Vert 3, so if you decide that you don't want to play Chewbacca's at all, and you're cutting one of the free drops in Ezra and Rogue, you can always just play third copy of Red 3 if you want to. Uh, but yeah, three copies of three P C3PO, and uh, I hope you guys are gonna play him more because he's an absolute beast of a card, and remember, when you cut down Chewbacca's and you add more free drops to your deck, you essentially even makes C3PO even better. Um, so that's quite amazing. So I'm just going to go quickly through the rounds that I played with some experiences from it. And and uh, round one, I played against Green Sabine. I lost the dice roll. Uh, I lost 1-2. I won the first game because of Azitak, as I said earlier. It absolutely allowed me to gain regain board control. Combine that with Jetta City, uh, I was able to take over the game because of that. Uh, then the third game, uh, uh, sorry, second game, even though um, it was really close, I just couldn't like get a hold of, of the board because I didn't draw uh, Falcons nor Auzitox. And uh, in the first game, I also didn't have Falcons. Third game, uh, I was able to start, but my draw was just abysmal, you know? And I also didn't draw Falcons. So it just feels felt like I never had the chance in the third game when I actually started because I just never had a good option when it comes to what to play. And uh, not drawing Falcons is, is, is like just a bit small. Just don't do that. If you if you just play Yellow Sabine, decide to draw Falcons or more often. That's my tip. Now, round two, I played against a Blue, Blue Vader. I lost the dice roll, of course, right? So two, four, uh, two dice rolls lost. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, against this type of deck, it doesn't really matter. Like when you play against a Control Vader, you just know that your deck is so heavily favored that you don't necessarily have to like even think about what to do you just try to punch them in the face and falcons are absolutely mvps because they typically tap themselves out and then you go to the face with a falcon and then you, they always have to deal with it and it's so annoying to deal with if they don't have like um like an open fire you know or a takedown four strokes doesn't work on it as well that's the one card that you kind of play around so if you play against a con vader control you know that they're going to have additional removal and force of four stroke in form of four strokes. So you try to play more vehicles because of that. So it always feels awful for them. And if they obviously like um, telegraph that they want to play four stroke, you might not even opt to play Sabine in that particular turn. So they skip on resources and you play it when they're tapped out and then you attack with a Sabine. I did that once, not particularly in this tournament, but essentially on the four resource round, I didn't play Sabine because of a like obvious entrench or force choke because he used two mana and was passing. But then on, on five resource, when he tapped out for a takedown to take down my Falcon, I, f I remember, I think, 
Or was it a takedown? That doesn't matter. He had like zero or one mana, but that was like the goal for me to actually use the Sabine and de deal those three points and then leave a unit again on board for him to deal with in the next turn. So essentially against this Blue Vader, I just want to zero, no problems. He had, that was a fun, one funny moment because in second game, he sided in Governors, which I don't believe is a good choice in the first place, but he sided in Governors, played Governor, Governors and said red free. And I just decided out red free because I just don't like them. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Now, round three was against uh, Iron Blue. And when I saw Iron Blue, I was like, oh my God. Oh, this is going to be long. I'm favorite, I think, against a double uh, Iron, even though it's like a very heavy control um, with Vigilances for four and a lot of units, right? Because they're going to be like... You're going to have those uh, pesky tanks that heal for four, for six mana. You're going to have, like, some early units in form of probes and so on. So there's some there's some early control of, of uh, in form of, of units as well. Um, but what I knew I had the advantage uh, in, in this case is that he cannot ramp in. So he's more predictable. He's in, uh, the the game plan for me is gonna be more straightforward because I know what to expect which turn you know um, and in this particular game um, I obviously lost the dice roll so three three times in a row I didn't win um, in the first game I lost it because I made a major blunder I left a um, I left the Aiden on th on three damage. Right, so she just needed one more damage to die, and I had an R two D two and a C three PO on the board, and I thought that one of those will deal the one damage. So I didn't sacrifice anything else. I kind of like greeted out for phase damage with space instead of killing the item directly that moment, and that absolutely blew back in my face because that item didn't die to the end of the game. And he just used every single removal to remove my C3POs and my R2D2s, even though it was awful, like, tempo-wise for him. But he kept that item alive, and I paid the price. He healed, like, 30 HP or something overall. Like, with all the Vigilances, all the make the openings, uh, and, and the items, I was like, oh my god. I would have easily won that game if I killed that item. If I killed that item in that moment, I win it because it was still very close. I left him at 27 damage uh, when he was killing me with the next action. So if I just killed that item, I essentially just win this game probably 2-0. But the mistake costed me the game. And I applied that knowledge to game 2 and 3. Um, I sided in uh, Disabling Fang Fighters. Sorry, I didn't side in for the second game Disabling Fang Fighters because I didn't see a single Entrench. And because he was playing so many units on the board, I was thinking to myself that maybe he doesn't play... Um, maybe he doesn't play Super Laser. So I didn't put in the Disabling Fang Fighters. And I sided out Bamboozles, of course. Sided in Spark of Rebellion. Sided in um, the Wolfies, and I sided out for that. Essentially, um, uh, I sided out Lotl Insurgents, and I sided out, if I remember correctly, um, one Specs for Soldier, I think, because I didn't see any Sentinels from his side. Uh, so that was that was my uh, that was my option, uh, and I essentially won the second game in like five minutes. I just rolled over him. Um, he had no way of keep uh, of keeping up with the with the board, and then the third game was very interesting because um, I played Spark of Rebellion on my first turn, and, and I saw three power to the dark side. Literally, just his entire hand was just three powers of the dark side. So I took that out, uh, and then I played on next on next turn. I played an R two D two and C three P O. Um, and that essentially drew me a card because of that combo, and he had to sacrifice one power to the dark side because he, he had no other option, and that, that, essentially that card draw that C3P was getting me almost every single round, like every other turn, he was not only hard to remove, but no one wanted to attack into him, uh, he essentially was getting so much value from the draws, I was never running out of steam, um, and essentially because of that, because of the sing single C3PO, I was able to drop every single uh, threat from my hand 
and never feel like I don't have fuel back. And there was a moment when I had like three units on the board and uh, he had like around 14 damage, I think. And I see how he looks at the board, looks at his health. He had seven mana. Uh, he was counting the damage. Like I literally can see like how he calculates how much damage will he get to the face if he just leaves them. And then he plays, and then he plays um, Search Your Feelings. I'm like, so if he counted the damage before playing the search for feelings, search for your feelings, then he obviously is fishing for the super laser. And I was holding a spark of rebellion for like several turns to like get into a moment when I knew it's gonna be good. And that was the moment because he <laughs> he looked for this uh, for for the for the super laser, but took it on the hand. I mean, I don't know what was it, right? But then I go, spark of rebellion. <laughs> and he shocks me the, the, the super laser blast I'm like yeah that one and I just go again to the phase and essentially seal the game so sometimes the spark of rebellion you don't just want to play when you have it you want to wait for the particular moment but it was incredibly funny because it was so telegraphed um, so so it's always fun to have those moments in the game and uh, so that was a 2-1 a win for me then I went into round 4 which I would think was the easiest game of the day, not because of the player not being skillful or something, but because of the, his deck choice. That was a talking green. And talking green against yellow Sabine that exactly knows what's going to happen is super easy to play. So I, let me explain my thought process. When I sit down against an opponent, whoever that is, first I look at the leader, then I look at his base. And then I make a quick mental check of what are the threats that I have to be aware of. If I play against blue, right, I know that I have to pay attention to power of the dark side, takedown, vanquish, vigilance. Those are the four threats that are going to be in majority of the blue blue decks, or even if not in the all of them, right? When you play against a double green, then there's not many threats because everything revolves around them having units on the board. Everything revolves around giving experience tokens. Everything revolves around having removal that requires you to have a unit on the board. So, overwhelming barrage, um, command, which essentially gives two experience tokens and then hits your your unit for X, right? Then you have the three resource strike through or something like that, so which essentially works the same, just deals damage from a unit to a unit. And uh, that's essentially it. So... When I sat down against a talking green, I knew that my only job in that game was to never let go of the board control. It doesn't matter if I deal damage to the face early, because if I will lose map control, if I lose board control at some point, I will not be able to finish him off, because the units will become too big. So, everything that I could, I just destroyed instantly. And for that, C3PO again was an absolute MVP. Um, drawing so many cards and keeping me afloat on the board and I was just fluting every turn I was just playing everything that I can and lieutenants were MVP because allowed to trade up uh, the uh, surprise attacks the same but didn't build that board control so to just drop something else on it and, you, and I was just flooding the board flooding the board and he could never keep up in, in game 2 there was a moment when in five resources he traitors my red free that I talked about earlier. I bamboozled and I essentially time walked the, the turn and I played a free drop on top of that so he never regained control from that. But in general, like having the ability to control the board and the main reason for that in that particular match was also Jedi City because whenever he played something on the ground, I just Jedi City, attack into it and that's it, you know? Um, so, uh, Auzitek was also in incredibly, uh, valuable because he was playing the, uh, TIE Interceptor. No, not the Interceptor. The other one that gives experience tokens. So it was like four resources, free two space, give two experience tokens, and Auzitek just kills that free two. And I bamboozled, I think, the experience tokens or something like that. So, I essentially never let go of the board control. It was the easiest match because of understanding how to win that match. Um, and then round five, oh, of course I lost the dice roll. Then round five, I played against Kranik Green. I lost the dice roll. So, so far, five rounds, I lost every single dice roll. And against Kranik Green, I didn't get to um, Millennium Falcon in game one or game two. It was 1-1. One, one. Um, but I drew multiple copies of uh, Farakosa Believen. So even though he was healing... 
for a cause I believe in was able to iron around the game the game. And in in this particular match, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember really well what happened. But uh it was very, very close. Um and in game three, I visibly remember drawing multiple copies of Falcon that he was dealing like, you know, dealt with one of Falcon, another one comes in and he just couldn't keep up. Like Falcon was an MVP. Uh, but it was a very close match. He had an incredible amount of healing. Wolfie uh, also came in clutch in one of the rounds to just deny uh, some of the uh, health back coming from like a potential attack from uh, Krennic and then essentially um, removing an option to uh, deny, make an opening heal or vigilance heal. And there was also a moment where Jeddah City was incredibly important because I played a Falcon. Or was that Ozzy Duck? can remember one of the space units and i went into his inferno fall no it had to be falcon because i used jetta city so i used jetta city killed his inferno fall and essentially didn't allow him to use a vigilance on my millennium falcon or to make an opening so it stayed on the board because of this uh and uh, i established space control because of that and he couldn't get get back uh, on that space, so it was dealing three damage every single turn, which was a very big clock. Uh, and but it was still a very close match. The player was pretty skillful, so it was an interesting match. Then on round six, I was playing against my um, uh, travel friend, uh, Franek, who is a very good player coming from Flesh and Blood as well in other card games, and he was playing Iron Green. And this is the first time I won the dice roll, and it was a very close matchup. Very, very, very close matchup. We went to game three. Uh, but in the entirety of the game, every single time what made the difference was the droids. The R2-D2s and the C-3PO's were an absolute menace to deal with um, and were able to draw so many cards and were just uh, g dealing singular points of damage, like death by count thousand cuts. There was one, one damage there, one damage here, and uh, drawing so many cards and, and just establishing my game plan as well because even if I didn't draw a card, I essentially knew what I'm going to draw. So I was able to change the, the, the decisions that I was doing in that particular turn because of that and it allowed me to like get into a better, um, better board state because of the additional informations. And I also didn't make the mistake that I did against the Iden Blue, where I kept um, Iden alive. So there was a moment where uh, one turn bamboozled uh, her into not attacking into me, it not killing my creature and destroying the shield, which allowed them to um, uh, trade with just one card to her. And essentially that was a big moment. Um, there was a moment as well where um, Millennium Falcons was just... I had an option to play three Millennium Falcons in a turn. You know, like uh, there was so many things that I didn't have to do because I was already winning on the board, but I had still options to do in case something went wrong. And I, I in game three, I never felt like I had lost control. Uh, but in game two, I definitely have been outvalued uh, because of what was it? Oh, man. Can't remember exactly, but uh, Franek also admitted that in game three he made a ah now I remember in game three Franek played a so I win leadered and I had a two one creature on on space and I wanted him to ECL a viper into that two one wing leader so I could then use an Oz attack to destroy the wing leader or a falcon to destroy that wing leader um sorry to destroy that viper right so instead he just played it. Instead of using the ECL, he just played the Viper in, in, in front of my wing leader. And next turn, I just falconed into his Viper, which essentially killed the Viper and let me live with both wing leader and um, uh, the Falcon. And then the next turn, he said that he could have just played uh, another Viper and then essentially killed the Falcon with it. But he decided not to do that and just leave space open because of that. And that was the mistake that he did that he never like kind of recovered from because I established space control in that moment and just run, run away with the game. But it was a very close, close matchup. Many micro decisions were like very dis, uh, like decided, deciding a lot of the tempo of the game. And it's just an interesting game. Like even though I played against two items, one blue and one green, every single match that I played against them, and there was over six rounds, felt like completely different games like it doesn't didn't really matter 
like what was happening in the game because at some point the game just felt completely different because of the different choices that you have you, you're standing uh, in front of and it feels like you have to solve a puzzle that is completely different from the puzzle that you just had before so it was very interesting matches and then in, in round seven I lost the Boba Greens to, to my knowledge, to the guy that won the entire tournament. I don't know because we didn't stay for the top eight. Um, but I lost the dice roll. So out of seven, I won one in the previous round on round six. And in this case, this was the most important round uh, um, dice roll because against Boba Green, like I just need to start. You know, I just need to start and hope he doesn't get ramp or anything. So I want to go into space, avoid technicians. But in every single game, he hit a. 10 freeze resupply and i it was so hard to game back to get back for it. and i also didn't draw falcons in this game like i think i've drawn only the falcons in the game that i won and in in but also i have to admit i think i made a huge mistake with my mulligan choices in game one so in game one my opponent has the initiative so he chooses to mulligan uh, he made that decision like instant like he sh he looked at the six cards and was like oh again so i look at my hand and i had a pretty decent hand that hand had a Lothal Insurgent, Ezra, and a um, K2SO. So I thought to myself, this looks pretty awesome. Like, I can drop two, three, four. And they are pretty best in slot in that case. I mean, not exactly best in slot for the turn two. That was the problem. So I didn't want to take the risk to mulligan away. Because in my, uh, in my mind, he was making a mulligan, right? So he, he is in a risk of getting another bad hand, and he has to keep it. So if he doesn't get the 2-2-2 two, two, two shield guy, the smuggle, whatever his name is, the yellow, the yellow small guy, my little insurgent either trades with everything that he has, or just is on the board. Unfortunately, he got that 2-2-2 two, two, two shielded, and because of that, I couldn't play Lotto Insurgent. And I literally lost the game on the spot because of that. So I felt like a moron for taking that decision. I should have mulliganed. I should have looked for R2-D2. I should have looked for C-3PO. I should have looked for A-Wing. I should have looked for X-Wing. Like, A-Wing... No, prop, no, scratch A-Wings. No, 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 no. A-Wings against Boba Green is just like, you can shoot yourself in the dick. So, uh, yeah, I, I should have looked for the droids. And if I didn't look for the droids, I should have looked for a wing, uh, X wings. Those are my best best choices. So you can also see how important would have been the decision to make to play three C three POs essentially. And uh, in order in the games that I won, I was able to just race him at some point. He established board control, but I saw an opening and I s s flipped the switch and I just went to face. And because of that, I was able to win. Uh, but in game three, um, it was on knife's edge and I just couldn't, I, I think I have, I remember now. I had a lethal on, on board with the card that I had in my hand, but he had a cunning for six resources and tapped two of my units. And I was like, well, I guess GG. So I was not able to brace him anymore after that cunning. And also in game three, I risked the wing leader, my C3PO. And he had a waylay. And he, after the game, he also told me that he only had two waylays in his deck. I didn't see a single waylay the, the, the two previous games. So I thought that he also sided them out because against Yellow Sabine, you don't really want them. I think so. Like the only good target would be the wing leader. But he kept both of them. So he had just never played them before. And on the one turn, it really mattered when I wing leader my C3PO, he wing leader that and I yeah, it was very hard to come back and then the cunning just sealed the deal but uh, I think I would still do a wing leader on the C3PO because it's such a power play but maybe maybe dropping, uh, because I put Ezra into resource role be, uh, that turn instead of doing the other way around maybe I should have just played Ezra instead, um, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed my breakdown of what was happening and hope you guys are gonna try out the deck if you have any questions uh you can leave a comment in the youtube section here and i'm gonna be happy to answer so loving the game hopefully i'm gonna be yeah i'm gonna be playing in the next showdown next week uh and we'll see how that goes all right love you all bye bye see ya